Francisco. It's the Cube covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Hey, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE live in San Francisco for Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier, the co-host of theCUBE, and this week for three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, my co-host analyst is John Troyer, the co-founder of Tech Reckoning, an advisory and community development services firm, uh, industry legend, formerly VMware. He's been on the, he was at theCUBE in 2010, our first ever CUBE nine years ago. John, day one wrap up. Let's analyze uh, what we heard and dissect and, and put Red Hat into day one in the books, but you know, clearly it's a red letter day for Red Hat, so to speak. Your thoughts? Uh, big day for OpenShift, I think, uh, and uh, hybrid cloud, right? We just saw a lot of signs here that we'll talk about that, that it's real. Uh, there's real enterprises here, real deployments, in the cloud, multi-cloud, on-site, hybrid cloud, and um, I think there's really no doubt about that. They really brought, uh, they brought the team out. And you know, Red Hat's become a bellwether relative to the tech industry because if you look at what they do, they have so many um, irons on the fires, but more, the most important is that they have huge customer base in the enterprise, which they've earned over decades of, of work. Being the open source renegade to the open source darling and tier one citizen, they got a huge install base and they got to manage it. So they can't just throw you know, spaghetti at the wall. They got to have big solutions. They're a very technical company. Um, very humble, but they do make some good tech bets. Absolutely, uh, we'll be talking with uh, the folks from CoreOS tomorrow, They've, they have a couple of uh, other you know, things we'll be talking about, a lot of interesting partnerships. The, um, the, most, you know, the thing here, Linux is real, and it's, yeah. if, it's, it's the 20 year growth, and it's real in the enterprise, and the, I mean, the top line thing, the top line slogan, John, is, is, you know, is Kubernetes the, is the new Linux uh, for the cloud, and I, I got to say there's some reality there. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I have my notes here. Just my summary for the day is, on that point, the new wave is here, okay? The glue layer that Kubernetes and containers provide on top of, say, Linux, in this case, OpenShift, a, you know, alternative past layer just a few years ago becomes the centerpiece of Red Hat's, you know, architecture, really providing some amazing benefits. So I think what's clear is that this new shift, this new wave is massive, and we've heard on theCUBE multiple references to TCP IP, HTTP. These are seminal moments where there's a massive inflection point, where the game just radically changes for the better. Um, wealth creation happens, startups boom, new brands emerge that we've never heard of that just come out of the woodwork. Entrepreneurial activity hits an all-time high, M&A. All these things are coming. Yeah, right? So John, I was really impressed. Uh, we talked to a number of folks who are involved with technologies that some people might call legacy, right? We, uh, the Java programmers, the IBM uh, WebSphere folks. I mean, you, you, you look at these technologies, solid, proven, tested, but yet still are here and adapted for today, right? And they talked about how they're fitting into OpenShift, how they're fitting into modern application development, and you're not leaving those people behind. They're really here. And you know, the old joke going back to say Microsoft when Steve Ballmer was the CEO, um, hell will freeze over when Linux is in, in Microsoft's <laughs> uh, ecosystem. <laughs> Look today no further than what's going on in their developer conference called Microsoft Build, where Linux is the centerpiece of their open source strategy and Microsoft has transformed themselves into a total open source world. So, you know, now you got Oracle giving up Java E, calling it Jakarta, essentially bringing Java into an, the Eclipse community, huge move, it's a kind of a nuanced point, but that's another signal of the shift going on out in the open where communities aren't just yesterday's open source model, a new generation of open source actors are coming in, a new, model, I think the CNCF is showing it, the Linux Foundation, proves that you can have commercialization downstream with open source projects as that catalyst point, yeah. as a big deal. And I think that is happening at a new, new level, and it's super exciting to see. Yeah, I mean, open source is the new normal, sure. That, that works, it's in the enterprise. But that doesn't mean that open source disappears. It actually means that open source and communities and companies coming together to drive innovation actually gets more and more important. I kind of thought, well, you know, it's open source. Well, it, 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 everybody does open source. But actually, the, uh, the dynamics we're seeing of these both large companies partnering with small companies, foundations like you talk about, the Linux, various parts of the Linux Foundation, Cloud Boundary Foundation, et 
cetera, right, are really making a big impact. Well, we had uh, earlier on Assistant General Counsel David Levine and bringing about open source, I think one key thing that's notable as this next generation of open source wave comes is the business model of open source and operationalizing it in not just software development lifecycle, but in the business operations. So for example, spending resources on managing proprietary products with, that have open source components separate from the community is a resource that you don't have to spend anymore. <laughs> if you just contribute everything to open source, that energy can go away. So I think open source projects and the product monetization component, not new concepts, is now highlighted as a bona fide competitive advantage across the company. Not, not just proven, but like operationally sound, legally verified, certified. And I think also you have to look at the distribution of open source versus the operation and management of open source. We see a lot of manage, managed Kubernetes coming out, and in fact, what we didn't talk about today, uh, Microsoft, big announcement here at the show, Microsoft is, uh, on Azure, is running a managed OpenShift. Not, not Kubernetes, they already have Kubernetes. They're running a managed OpenShift. Another way of adding value to an open, open source platform, to the, directly to the IT operator. Honestly, do you think these kind of deals would happen if you throw, go back four years <laughs> and three years ago? Oh, no way. Azure Absolutely. running an open shift? Absolutely. I mean, what are you, crazy? The, uh, you know, the, 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 the kingdom is turned upside down, absolutely. So this is a notable point, I want to get your reaction to this, because I see this absolutely as validation to the new wave being here with Kubernetes containers as a de facto rallying point, an inflection point. Big deals are happening, IBM and Red Hat, big deal, we just talked about them with the players here. Two bellwethers saying, we're getting behind containers and Kubernetes in a big way. From that relationship, essentially, it changes the game literally overnight for IBM, changes the game for Red Hat, I think a little bit more for IBM than Red Hat, although Red Hat gets a ton of benefit, but IBM instantly gets a cloud strategy that has a real scalable product market to it. Arvin, the, the uh, uh, head of research, laid that out, and IBM now can go and compete with major players on deals with the private cloud. More deals are coming. Absolutely. This is the beginning. Now that everyone's snapped into place and saying, okay, Kubernetes and containers, we now understand this. The rallying cry, a de facto standard, I think a formation is going to happen in the next six to 12 months uh, of major Major, major players. Now, I mean, we are in a not, one size does not fit all world, John. So, I mean, we will continue to see healthy ecosystems. I mean, Mesosphere and D DCOS is still out there, Docker is still out there, right? You will see uh, very functional communities and, and functioning application platforms and cloud platforms, but I, you got to say the momentum oh, is here. No, I mean, look at, Do I mean, Docker, Mesosphere's, Look at, when things like this happen, this is my opinion, so I'm just going to say it out there. <laughs> when you have de facto standards that happen like this, it's an opportunity to differentiate. So I think what's going to happen is Docker, Mesosphere, and others, including the legacy guys like IBM and, and, and others, they have to differentiate their products. They have to be software companies. <laughs> so I think Docker, I think, is something, we'll find out at DockerCon, but my opinion, looking at from the outside, is I think Docker's realized, look, we can't make money from containers. Kubernetes is happening, we're a great standard in that, Let's be a software company. Let's differentiate around Kubernetes. So this is just more pressure or more call to action to deliver good software. Hey, it's never been a, somebody said, it's never been a better time to be in IT and IT infrastructure, right? This is a, you think that the tools we have available to us, super powerful. Another key point I want to get your reaction on, uh, with Kubernetes and containers, this kind of de facto standardization, is breathing new life into good initiatives and legacy projects, so you think about OpenStack. Okay, OpenStack gets a nice segmented approach, it's now clear where the, where the swim lanes are. You, you're an app developer, you go over here, and if you're a network and infrastructure guy, you're going here, but middleware apps, we talked to the Red Hat guys here, we talked to IBM, those legacy and apps can put a container around it and don't have to be thrown away and take their natural course. Yeah, I think yeah. it's going to be a through line through this whole week. So, a second life is for legacy and stuff. Um, and then two, cloud is in its second inning because now you have the enablement for cloud. Your reaction? The enablement of cloud. Yeah, well, I, mean, there's... I mean, look at IBM. IBM has cloud and the yeah. market shares depending on who you believe. They're not in the, they're in the top three, but they're not double digits according to Synergy research. And Wikibon has a little bit higher, but still, if you compare public cloud, they're small. Sure. But if you look at IBM's entire install base and saying if they have a specialty yeah. cloud that can be assembled quickly, yeah. Yeah. And scaled, and they're going to be instantly successfully overnight. Yeah, I, I think a few years ago, um, you know, there was a lot there. 
always a few years back, it always looks confusing, right? A few years back, we were still arguing, public cloud, private cloud, is private cloud dead? Is, what is a true private cloud? Is that even valuable? I still see people on Twitter uh, making fun of every, anybody who's not 100% into the, the full public cloud, which means they must not have talked to uh, you know, a lot of IT folks who have to, business to run today. So I think you're seeing it's a, it's a, it's a multivalent world, multi-cloud, there's going to be differentiated clouds, there's going to be operational clouds, there's going to be financial clouds, and it, just, it's, it, it seems clear that you know, from the perspective of right now, here in San Francisco in 2018, that, um, that uh, you know, the purpose of public, private, hybrid seems pretty clear, just like the purpose of, uh, like I say, we're going to, in two weeks we'll be an OpenStack Summit, I mean, the purpose of that seems pretty clear. It's, it's funny, it's like I had this argument with Andy Jassy, he thinks everything should go to the public cloud, because he has one of the public clouds, but he's kind of right, and, I, and, I, and we talk about it this way I, with him, I said, if everything is running cloud operation, we're talking about cloud ops, we're talking about how it's managed, how it's deployed, code bases, across the Board. If everything is cloudified from an operation standpoint, the difference between on-prem and cloud and IoT edge, is, there's no difference, stuff's moving around, so you can almost treat the data center as an edge network. So, no. it's essentially all cloud in my yeah. mind. So and, and also you do have to keep in mind time, uh, time horizons, right? Anybody who has to do work the today, this quarter, right, has to keep in mind what's, what, what portfolio of uh, business needs and tools do I have right now versus what it's going to look like in a few years. All right, so I want to get your thoughts on your um, um, walk away from today. I'll start, I, my walk away uh, from day one was talking to some of the practitioners, uh, Macquarie uh, Bank and Amadeus. To me, they're a tell sign, the canary in the coal mine of what's happening. Horizontally scalable, synchronous infrastructure, the new model is here, now we're seeing them saying things like, it's a streaming world, not just Kafka for streaming data, streaming services, levels of granularity that are orchestrated with containers and Kubernetes up and down the stack. To me, architects who think that way will have a preferred advantage over everybody else. That to me was like, okay, we're seeing it play out. Mm. I guess I, I totally agree, right? The future isn't evenly distributed. My takeaway though is there's certainly a future here and uh, the people we talk to today are doing real world, enterprise scale, multi-cloud microservices and modern architectures, incorporating their legacy uh, applications and components and, that, and they're just doing it and they're not even breaking a sweat. So I think IT has really changed. Okay, day one coverage continues, day two tomorrow. We have three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, day two, and then finally day three uh, Thursday here in San Francisco. This is theCUBE's live coverage. Go to thecube.net to check out all the videos that are going to be going up as soon as they're done live here, and check out all the CUBE alumni, and check out siliconangle.com for all news coverage. And of course, check out Tech Reckoning, John's company he's the co-founder of. For John Furrier and John Troyer, that's day one in the, in the books. Thanks for watching, see you tomorrow. <laughs>